Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us at this very special event. We are honored to have Dr. Anthony Fauci here with us today at Brown University virtually. Uh, he is one of the world's leading infectious disease physicians. And in just a few moments, he'll be joining our incoming Dean of the School of Public Health, uh, Dr. Ashish Jha, for a conversation about the extraordinary challenges and responsibilities of public health practitioners and policymakers uh, in this battle against COVID-19. So before I introduce Dr. Uh, Fauci and Dean Jha, I want to acknowledge that under any other circumstance, we would be doing this event preferably in person. And unfortunately, the realities of living with a pandemic uh, mean that we have to be virtual. So we look forward to the time in the future, hopefully not too long, when we'll be able to be together again and in person. And perhaps Dr. Fauci can shed some light on when that time may come. So in this inaugural event, in what will be a virtual series of community conversations with global health leaders sponsored by the Brown School of Public Health, uh, we're off to a really great start. Uh, the audience that we have today, we have more than I think 2,700 people registered for today's event, uh, lots of people turning in live stream and hundreds have already submitted questions. So we'll try to get to as many of these as possible. I will not give a long introduction. And you'll also have opportunities to submit questions in real time. So there's no question that this virus has brought with it some extraordinary challenges. And we're facing many of those challenges right here at Brown, including the prospect of what the upcoming semester will bring. Uh, but while we have the expertise of an expert like Dr. Fauci, today's conversation will be focused more broadly on the national and global landscape of COVID-19. So I want to thank Dr. Fauci for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, he is a member of the White House Coronavirus Task Force. He has become a recognizable, very recognizable face in homes across America over these past few months. And in a recent poll, uh, Americans said that they cited Dr. Fauci as the most trusted source of information on COVID-19. And that's for very good reason. He has been the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases for more than 35 years. And in that role, he's advised six presidents on domestic and global health issues, including HIV AIDS, SARS, Ebola, he was one of the principal architects of the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, PEPFAR, a program that has saved millions of lives throughout the developing world. And he's the recipient of numerous awards, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom and the National Medal of Science, among many other recognitions. Despite this impressive background, and I think this is important, Dr. Fauci takes the time to mentor young scholars. And in fact, I know that one of our own emergency room, uh, emergency medicine residents here at Brown, uh, Dr. Luke Messick, received advice and encouragement from Dr. Fauci when he was an undergraduate student. And he's now on the front lines dealing with COVID-19 right here in Rhode Island. And I think all of us look forward to being students of Dr. Fauci for today's conversation. I also want to introduce Dr. Jha, our incoming Dean of the Brown School of Public Health, and we are thrilled to welcome Dr. Jha to Brown. He is currently, until I think August 31st, uh, the KT Lee Professor of Global Health at the Harvard School of Public Health, where he directs Harvard's Global Health Institute. And he's also a practicing general internist and a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, and he will be at Brown as well. His extensive research portfolio focuses on improving the quality and the and reducing the cost of healthcare systems. And he's widely published in leading journals and is also a leading public voice on a range of healthcare issues, including epidemics and pandemics. So with that, I will turn the program over to Dr. Jha. Thank you. Chris, thank you so much. And again, Dr. Fauci, thank you for being here and being part of this. Um, so we really are excited to have you here. And, Part of it is that the nation is feeling, I think, unsettled. Um, we went through a you know, difficult time in March and April and May, and the last couple of months have been difficult for 
uh, a lot of the country, many people who thought that the pandemic was behind us. And so I'm wondering if you could start us off by just giving your sort of temperature check on where are we as a nation? Uh, and particularly, where, what are some highlights of things that you think are going well? And uh, where should we be focused in the weeks and months ahead uh, as we look to the fall and winter? Well, uh, I should thank, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me with you. It really is, is a great pleasure to be here. You, you ask a, a really simple question that can only be answered uh, by a complicated answer. And I'm not going to give you a complicated answer, but I'm going to tell you why it's complicated. Because you said, what is going on in the United States of America? And one of the things that's a little bit different than some, and if not many of the countries who have been challenged by this, is how large and diverse our country is, geographically, demographically, as well as the level of virus in any particular region, state, city, county. So when you look at what individual areas are doing, some are doing very well. Some have been hit in a mild way in controlling. Some have been hit badly, like the northeastern part of the country, your own Boston, New York City, where you've had a terrible burden, you've come down, and you're now testing positive at you know, less than 1%, which is really very good, despite the pain and suffering you went through. There are other areas of the country that did not get hit too badly. But then when they try to reopen, I think the diversity, the, the spirit of our country about how you pay attention to guidelines to tell you how you can safely reopen somehow or other got us into some trouble. Because when we try to open in some of those Southern states, and that's where we are right now, what happened is that we never really got down to a good baseline. As a country, we went up, came down, but instead of going all the way down, like the maps of many of the European countries shows, we plateaued at around 20,000 cases per day, as you know very well. And we did that for a couple of months until we decided appropriately that we needed to open the country. We couldn't stay locked down. The economy was suffering. We needed to get the economy back. So we decided, and we did, to make guidelines of how you can prudently open. Checkpoints. There's the gateway, phase one, two, three. You know it so well. You talk about it all the time correctly. The issue is now that what happened is when we try to do that, there was a great deal of variability. We didn't do it in a uniform way. Some states try to do it really well. They put the guidelines out, but the people in the state took the attitude that it was all or none. So we were locked down. Now that we're open, let's just open. And I think you might remember, I said that so explicitly at some of the major daily press conferences that we had from the White House, where I even used the same terminology. You can go back and superimpose the clips on it, where I said, we don't want to go one way or the other. We've got to go in a way that's prudent. But in other states, I'm not going to name them, that what happened is the leadership skipped over some of the checkpoints. So what we had was instead of going down, we had gradually going up to 30, 40, 50, 60, and even 70,000 cases per day. And when that happens, as you well know, Ashish, the hospitalizations go up and then the deaths go up. So the question is, what are we gonna do about it? So I always like to just look straight ahead. Take a look at a good example. What Arizona did when they got hit, they were one of the states, Arizona, California, Texas, Florida. They instituted what I keep referring to, and I would please allow me to say it once, and then I'll refer back to it during the up. There are five or six things that you could do, which Arizona did to bring them way down. And that is what I call the fundamental principles. Universal wearing of a mask, physical distancing, avoid crowds, outdoor better than indoor, washing your hands and, and, and hand hygiene. And if you're in a situation where it applies to you, stay away from bars. Bars are bad news when it comes to the spread and you have a lot of infection. Ashish, if we do those things, and, and I'm just gonna repeat it again till I'm exhausted, those things work. 
So what, the, what, what I think that the misinterpretation in our country is that when you have something that needs everybody pulling at the same time, if you have one weak link in there that doesn't do it, it doesn't allow you to get to the end game. And I believe strongly, and I'll say very clearly, that we do not have to completely lock down if we do things right. And if we do those things right, I believe we can open up the economy, get the employment back, get people out of the doldrums of being locked down if we do it prudently, carefully, and the way the guidelines say. Thank you. That's, a re that's really helpful. And let me just uh, pick up on that a little bit and, and ask, so how do you think we got into a discussion where it became lockdown or open up everything? And, and you know, I, I think about uh, Governor ne uh, Gavin Newsom, who often talks about a dimmer switch and this idea that if things get too much, you, do you see kind of control mechanisms as a, as a dimmer switch? And, 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 and sort of was there stuff that we in the public health community did to not adequately sort of lay out that the choices are not just open up everything or stay locked down? So two related questions. You know, Ashish, we tried, I certainly tried that. You know, I said that so many times at the daily press hearings. I, I kept on going, you know, we don't want an all or none. We don't want an all or none. We've got to realize that there are things that we can do because what it was is that I believe and it's possibly, Ashish, because we, we, I mean, anybody who says we're not living in a divisive era in our country is not paying attention to what's going on in our country. So what happened, it became, instead of public health and good public health principles, the things that you and I live by in our professional life every day, instead of saying, let's utilize the public health principles as a vehicle to opening up the country. It was as if there's public health principles and then there's open up the country. And, and they're not, they're synergistic with each other. And we really need to get that point across that one is not the enemy of the other. One is a gateway to get to the other. And that's the reason why you know, I'm, I, I call myself a realist, you know, uh, but I'm a cautious optimist too. And I think that if we can somehow get the country unified to do that together, I don't think we need to go into the fall and the winter thinking we're going to have a catastrophe. We could go into the fall and the winter coming out of it looking good if we do certain things. And do you think the experience of the last few weeks, we finally started seeing real flattening and coming down. You mentioned of Arizona, Texas, uh, Florida, South Carolina. Does that give you hope that we're heading towards a bit more of a unified vision of what we need to do uh, as a country? Is some of that divisiveness starting to melt or do you feel like we're gonna continue struggling with that? You know, I, I think the proof of the pudding, Ashish, is gonna be what happens in those states that are the yellow, you know, for those of listening, there's the green and then there's the yellow and there's the red. For those states that are starting to see an uptick in the percent positive. When we went back, and, and here's something that Deb Bergs did a good job on. She went back and started analyzing. And she found out that if you really look carefully, when you have a percent positive that clicks up even a couple of percentage points, it almost never turns around spontaneously unless you do something different than you're doing. And it's the old rule that you and I know well. What's happening now was triggered two weeks ago. What you're doing now is going to manifest itself two weeks from now. So when you see that little tick going up, that means that you were doing something not particularly good here. So what you need to do is to change what you're doing. And that's the reason why you're asking me, how do I feel? The proof of the pudding is if those states that are starting to see the ticking up uniformly, instead of rejecting public health measures, uniformly do the five or six things that I mentioned, and they turn around, then I think we have a clear pathway. I really do believe we do. Great. So 
let me switch gears a little bit and ask you a question that everybody asks me. And I always essentially try to channel my inner Tony Fauci, as I think all public health people do, and try to think, you know, what would, what would Tony say about this? Um, which is timelines around the vaccine and the optimism around vaccines. Because there are people who think, you know, it takes us years to build vaccines. We've still never built one for HIV. How, how can we be so confident that we're going to have one? And so, so let me, the question I have for you is, is really twofold. One is, how confident are you that we're going to have a vaccine, let's say by the end of this year or early next year? And then one of, our, um, one of the members of our community, Donna Williamson, just sent in a question asking about people who are older. And how will we, how confident are you that vaccines will be able to protect older people in terms of immunologic uh, response? And is there anything we need to pay particular attention to on the issue of vaccinating the elderly who obviously are at much higher risk of complications of this disease? So a bit in general about vaccines and then a bit about, the, about elderly people and vaccines. Good, okay, thanks. And she's, I'm gonna talk quickly in my typical New York manner <laughs> because there's, there's a lot of information here. So I, I wanna put to rest this, this issue that we've been trying to get a vaccine for HIV for, you know, for 35 years. And now we have this vaccine attempt towards uh, COVID-19 and SARS coronavirus too. They're really very, very different. And just let me say it and hope we could have people play this over and over. When you have a disease in which the body's natural response to infection is inadequate, then it is very difficult for you to get a vaccine. And we know from the 39 years that I've been taking care of AIDS patients and doing HIV, the body does not make a naturally good immune response against HIV, which means you got a lot of problem because you've got to do better than natural infection to get a vaccine for HIV. Okay, switch, SARS coronavirus 2. We know that the body is capable of making a good response. And the reason we know is because we have so many people who clear the virus and do well. So the goal of a vaccine is to do as well or hopefully better than natural infection in inducing a good response. There's the answer to your first question, Ashish. Why do I feel not confident? I've been developing vaccines now as director of the Institute for 36 years. You should never feel confident when you're dealing with something that requires a randomized placebo-controlled trial to prove it. You feel confident when you start to see the data come in. So what I'm confident is in data. I'm not confident in guessing or surmising. But having said that, the reason I do feel cautiously optimistic is that when you look at the early response, both in the animal data, but importantly, in the human phase one, it induces a response with neutralizing antibodies that's at least as good, if not better, than the plasma of convalescent people, which tells me that's a good start. It's not a guarantee, Ashish, but it's a good start. So that's my cautious optimism. Second part of your question, the speed. Everybody's concerned about, well, and good people who I deeply respect, say, how could you possibly say you might have one at the end of the year, the beginning of 2021? Well, let me give you one frame and you could extrapolate at multiple steps. When you make a vaccine for a pathogen that you need to grow up in the classic way and then inactivate it or attenuate it, and even when you use molecular means, when we made a vaccine against SARS, the original SARS, it was a DNA platform from the time we got the sequence to the time we went into phase one was 20 months. We went from sequence of the mRNA, which we got on January 10th. We started to work on the 15th. We were on a phase one 62 days later. There was no compromising of safety because we never even went near a patient. But the time from doing the platform technology we saved a year already. So then you go to what about the phase three that we started last week? The reason is we did everything at risk. So time out before somebody takes that and makes it a sound bite. The risk is to the money. 
The risk is not to the patient. So we make investments in clinical trial sites. We do guaranteed purchases of vaccine before we even know it works. So right away, what you're doing is you're saving a lot of time. So in that context, given that we started, and it's not just one vaccine, we got six vaccines that are going in sequentially, but two got started on January 27th, the Pfizer and the Moderna. So take the Moderna, which I know more about because it was developed here in collaboration with Moderna. You get a prime on day zero, a boost on day 28, and then what you do is you try in a period of a month and a half to two to enroll individuals. If we do that, we will likely be fully enrolled in the early fall, uh, let's say October sometime. If there's a lot of hot infections then, we hopefully will get an answer sometime around November or December. And if it's really hot infections, it could be a little bit early, I don't know. My personal opinion, with no guarantee, that we'll probably have an answer sometime November, December. Now, I hope that answer is that it's safe and effective, but I can't guarantee it. You only can rely on my cautious optimism. Then the next question is, what about getting vaccine for people? They've already guaranteed they're gonna have hundreds of millions of doses in 2021. If you look at the first couple of months of 2021, we're not gonna have 100 million doses. We're gonna have tens of millions of doses, which means that we gotta prioritize, which is your fourth question. How about people like the elderly and those with underlying conditions? The standard way that you're very familiar with, when you have a paucity of interventions and you gotta prioritize, the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices is a standard committee that advises the CDC. So it's their responsibility. What we're doing, the NIH and CDC together have commissioned the National Academy of Medicine to complement that process hmm. by getting a group of independent individuals, ethicists, biologists, et cetera, to help them make the recommendations. I don't know what they're gonna be, but if it's like we usually do, you'll prioritize healthcare workers, frontline people, those who need it the most, the elderly, those with underlying conditions. We do hope that the elderly will get a good response. The way you determine that is you make sure your vaccine trials have people who are per perfectly well and young, people who are elderly and well, and people who are elderly and or young with underlying conditions. They're gonna be tried, so we're gonna know at the end of the trial whether or not you induce a good response in those individuals. Sorry for the long answer, but you asked four questions. No, I, I didn't realize I had asked four questions, but you're right, I did ask four questions. Um, but I'm gonna just build on one that, that last one. Are you at all concerned about immunologic response in older people, or do you, and again, I understand I'm asking you to predict when we don't have the data, What's your, what's your sense from what we've seen? There, you know, there, that one Chinese trial uh, included people over 55. Uh, is, that, is that an area that you worry about? Or do you think, uh, and I'm asking you to speculate without data and I apologize for that, but um, there's no one whose speculation I would value more. So just what's your guess on that? Well, I mean, if, if things hold true, Ashish, with vaccines, this vaccine, that you would not expect the elderly to have as robust a response to anything that a younger person does. However, when you look at the trials in which you're talking about individuals who are at a certain age, it looked like we were getting a reasonably good response. But that's such a small number, Ashish, I don't make any, I, I wanna see what the 30,000 person trial does. Then I'll let you know. Sounds great. Um, I wanna move on to um, another thing that people think a lot about, which is uh, upcoming therapeutics. Uh, so we've got two drugs that seem to, in randomized trials, be helpful, right? Remdesivir and dexamethasone. And there has been, as you know, a lot of enthusiasm and, and a lot of kind of fingers crossed for antibodies, monoclonal, polyclonal antibodies. Um, where are we on the science on that? Yeah. And then is there an effort to ramp up production kind of, again, at risk 
uh, financial risks to the government or whoever to make sure that there's plenty of supplies. So if the clinical trials turn positive, uh, we can give it to lots of people. Yeah. You just give us a bit of a status update on therapeutics. On yeah. that. Well, there are at least three companies that are now investing, and maybe four. In, in fact, quite frankly, there's maybe more that I don't even know about. But there are three or four that we're dealing with who are going the monoclonal antibody route, namely an antibody natural product, you build it up, you passively infuse it. They are directed either singly or in combination against the major part of the spike protein, which binds for the ACE2 receptor. A few days ago, we announced two trials. In fact, there were three trials. One, the company's doing independently of prophylaxis, and two that are a therapy. And it relates to what you said about dexamethasone and remdesivir. That's for late disease. Dexamethasone, ventilators, oxygen, remdesivir, oxygen in the hospital. The two monoclonal antibody trials, one is an outpatient trial of an individual who are clearly infected but don't require hospitalization. The other is those that are hospitalized but are not in intensive care requiring ventilation. That's good news, Ashish, because we had a real need for what we do early to prevent people from advancing to the need for hospitalization or if they're in hospitalization for having to go to intensive care. Those trials started, the companies are telling us that they are in fact proceeding at risk some of them are even being subsidized by the federal government to mitigate their risk to proceed to make the product. Then there are other things that we're doing, like convalescent plasma. We're still analyzing the data to see if, in fact, that works, and we're going to hopefully complement that with data from randomized placebo-controlled trial. Then there's a whole host of other therapeutics, things that are directed at the virus itself, small molecules, antiviral type approaches, as well as some of the secondary complications like the microthrombi and thromboembolic events that we're looking at anticoagulants. There's a lot of action going on. Anything else that you're uh, hopeful about beyond antibodies or just right now nothing that has gotten? Uh... Well, you know, having been so deeply involved, Ashish, with the combination antiretroviral therapies that were literally like miracle drugs for HIV. I'm hoping that we're doing all these other things, but that we come up with something that as soon as somebody comes in with a positive test, bingo, you hit him with an antiviral and you're done. That's what I see for the future. Quite frankly, there really is no reason why we cannot do that. There's no reason why that's not possible. Heck, if we did it for HIV, we can do it for coronavirus. You know, yesterday, just as a quick side point, I, I was uh, giving grand rounds at UCSF and, and no reason you'd remember this, but the first time you and I met, I was a senior resident at UCSF presenting research and you were our research uh, scholar visitor of the, of the day. And what I was describing to students and residents yesterday is I started in 1997, saw a ton of cases of pneumocystis pneumonia, toxoplasmosis. They were, I, I, you know, those were patients I saw every day. 2001, my last year at UCSF, I don't think I saw a single case of pneumocystis pneumonia. It was amazing that this disease transformed in a four-year period. So science, when it works, really is miraculous. And HIV certainly did that. And it feels like, even though this one has been so hard, we've been moving uh, so quickly with so much progress so fast. Yeah, but capture that message, Ashish, because I think the people, particularly the young people, who are really getting down about this, uh, who have not had the experience with HIV that you and I have had, that, that this is gonna end. And it's gonna end because of science. Right. Can I ask you my last question, then I have a few students lined up who, who wanna ask you a few questions. But um, in 2017, uh, right after the election, uh, but before President Trump was inaugurated, uh, we held an event in uh, D.C. I was with Georgetown, so John Monahan, Larry Gostin, all people, Rebecca Katz, people you know well. And it was a Harvard-Georgetown event uh, where you were a keynote speaker. And it was about preparing for the next pandemic. And one of the areas we talked quite a bit about was the issue of how do we, when we don't know what that next pathogen is going to be, and you called it disease X, um, how do we invest against that unknown pathogen. So as we emerge from this pandemic, 
let's say next year, things are starting to get back to more normal, whatever that might mean. And there is an interest in saying, let's not do this again, or let's do it better next time. What are a couple of areas that you would advise uh, the president, Congress to invest in, not for, not for SARS-CoV-2, not for COVID-19, but for an influenza, another coronavirus, uh, Nipah, who knows, or, or a disease that we don't know about. What are the kinds of investments we can make to better prepare our country, our world uh, for the next pandemic, which will surely happen again? Well, there are multiple areas of issues, some of which directly involve what I'm responsible for, but it goes well beyond what I do as a physician scientist like yourself, a physician scientist. We need to build up the public health infrastructure locally and domestically in our own country, which because of the successes over the decades, we've let that go in somewhat of a disrepair. We've also got to increase our international links, you know, the global health strategic networks that we put together. But from a scientific standpoint, there are things that I'd like to see more of that we have done. And that is, you take a look, is that you can guess what particular microbes might emerge because they're lingering. That's one way, but you gotta be careful because if you guess wrong, how many times have we guessed right, Ashish, lately? <laughs> not right. track record itself. Not very, not very many times, but there are two other things that you could do. And I call it prototype pathogen. Namely, pick classes of microbes that you've dealt with. I mean, if you look at the flaviviruses, what we learned from yellow fever that helped us with Zika and other infections. Then there's what's called platform technologies. In other words, to develop the platforms of drugs that could be universal so that you have a drug that's against any kind of a coronavirus. You could then get vaccine platforms which we've done very well on. I've just described one that allowed us to shave a year and a half just on the platform technology alone. We need to keep perfecting that. So prototype pathogens, study the prototypes, get a universal flu vaccine, get a universal coronavirus vaccine, and then platform technology. If we do that as scientists and let the public health world do the public health things, those two things together, I think I'm going to prepare us much better. Great. I have a bunch of other questions, but I'm actually going to now take a pause and get to some of our student questions. And the first one uh, comes from Shekinah Fashwa, who is uh, a doctoral student and has, it wants to ask a question. I, I got to see it first that I was desperate to ask you, but she was going to be able to articulate it so much better. So I said, let's let, the, let someone else smarter than me ask this question. So Shekinah, up to you. Hi, thanks so much, Dr. Jha. So my question is about the two pandemics that we've seen colliding, both racism and COVID-19. And what could be uh, the impact of seeing these pandemics colliding and the disproportionate impact they, that they've had on Black and Brown communities? What could that mean for public health policy in the future? Well, it's unfortunate. I, I refer to that um, as the double whammy against the minority community. And when you get a double shot, you know, it's time to look up and say, we got to do something about this. So for example, as you well know, you don't like to generalize, but as a general demographic group, minorities, Latinx, African Americans, Native Americans, but let's take African American for the sake of just a single prototype. On the basis of the jobs that you have that are much more the essential frontline jobs that require you to be out in the community. Already from square one, you have a greater risk of getting infected than someone who can sit behind a computer and telework all day. That's the first thing. I'll get back in a second to what to do about that. Then there's the other thing that is really the chronic decades and decades old dilemma of the social determinants of health, which is why African Americans have a higher degree of diabetes, of hypertension, of obesity, of heart disease, of chronic lung disease, of kidney disease. That's a reality. 
That does not need to be. But to get corrected, you have to make a decades long commitment to change that. The thing you can do now is to make sure that resources are concentrated geographically to those demographic groups that are clearly at higher risk of infection. So they can get immediate testing, immediate results, immediate access to healthcare. So one, we can do something about now, but I always say if there's always kind of a silver lining in, in bad things that happen, if there is a silver lining, it should tell us that virtually every disease that I've been involved with, take HIV, I've devoted most of my life to that. The African-American community, 13% of the population is African-American, 45% of the new infections are among African-Americans. That's unacceptable. We've got to do things societally that change that. So that's what I think about the two clashing things you're talking about. Maybe it'll be a wake up call to society to change. Great, thank you, Shekinah, that's, that was really terrific. All right, next question is from Catherine Berry, who is a medical student. Uh, Catherine, are you on? Yes, hi, Dr. Fauci. Do you have any advice for the future physicians who are watching? Uh, yeah, I, I think that for the future physicians that are watching, I mean, uh, Ashish and I are prejudiced because we're infectious disease doctors and public health people. But, you know, whatever discipline you go into, I think you should realize the importance of the profession you've chosen. Um, so my advice is, I mean, as I've always say, um, you're getting excellent training. So that's square one. You're really smart or you wouldn't be where you are. Uh, so the next thing to do is to keep an open mind to see what suits you the best for what you want to do to pursue your professional career. And I could give you, you know, over a beer, a whole evening worth of, of, of suggestions, but there's one that I could do in 30 seconds. In my own career, the thing that has shaped what I've done has been less my planning than the circumstances that thrust themselves in front of me completely beyond my control. So my advice is keep an open mind. You can control your training because you're doing it. You genetically have nothing to do with the fact that you're really smart, which thank goodness you are. But you're going to be making a choice as opportunities come your way as to what you want to do. The only thing I say, keep your eyes and your ears open and keep an open mind. What I wanted to do when I was at your stage was to practice medicine at the New York Hospital in New York City as a member of the teaching faculty. I had no idea that I'd be involved in research because I didn't even know if I was any good. I was just gonna be somebody who was doing things with autoimmune inflammatory diseases and infections that, that essentially complicate that. And then all of a sudden in 1981, something happened beyond my control that completely changed my life. And that was HIV. If I had been distracted thinking about something else, I wouldn't have noticed, holy mackerel, this is a new disease. I want to study it. So just keep an open mind. Opportunities are going to come your way that you can't imagine. All right. Thank you. Um, next question from Margaret Elam from the Watson Institute. Margaret, can you um, join us? Hi, Dr. Fauci. Right now in the MPA program, we're learning about government intervention and program evaluation. And I wanted to know, uh, in the light of the current pandemic, what are the most important aspects of these fields to consider from your perspective? Well, I mean, I, you know, I think you're seeing a living example of the importance of government intervention, government leadership, uh, government interaction with the, with the uh, academic and public health community. I mean, boy, if ever you wanted to be in, a, in an arena right now, I think, Margaret, you picked the right one. Yeah, I mean, I mean, just take a look at what's going on. 
I, I think some people um, understandably get confused. You know, government can't do everything. The private industry can't do everything. Academia can't do everything. But when they synergize together, it's amazing what can be done. Yeah, if there was ever a case for important uh, work and good policy, you could argue this is this is that moment. All right, we have one more uh, from Abdullah Shahipar. Abdullah, are you on and can you unmute yourself? Hi. Master student from our school. Hi, uh, hi, Dr. John, Dr. Fashi. Thank you for your work. So my question is about vaccine. There's a lot of talk in America about getting a vaccine and getting back to normal. What do you think Americans should expect from a vaccine rollout? And what do you think they should expect from themselves? At that point? Yeah, that's a great question, Abdullah. And, I, I, and thank you, because it gives me uh, the opportunity to make a point. So when you're talking about a vaccine, um, if this were measles, in which you could guarantee that if you get vaccinated, it's likely you're 97 to 98 uh, percent uh, protected, then you don't have to worry about anything else, but just get yourself vaccinated. When you're dealing with a vaccine for a disease like coronavirus, in which you're talking about the natural response of immunity, generally is finite. In other words, we don't know yet what the efficacy might be. I believe we'll get an effective vaccine, but we don't know if it's gonna be 50% or 60%. Hopefully, I'd like to see 75% or more. But the chances of it being 98% effective is not great, which means you must never abandon the public health approach. You've gotta think of the vaccine is a tool to be able to get a pandemic to no longer be a pandemic, but to be something that's well controlled. And by well controlled is my, I wouldn't say my vision, that sounds too haughty, but what I'd like to see is that, you know, I know you're learning this in your course because it's the, one of the tenets of infectious diseases. There's control, there's elimination, and there's eradication. We've only eradicated one human infection in the history of the planet, and that's smallpox. But what we've done very successfully is that we've eliminated polio from the United States and a lot of other countries. We've eliminated malaria. And then we've controlled other diseases to a really good level. So what I'm shooting for is with a vaccine and good public health measures, we could bring it down to somewhere between really good control and elimination. That's what a vaccine is going to do, but it's not going to do it alone. Great. Um, I have a couple more questions coming in. And, and Tony, I know you've got about three, four minutes before we got to wrap this up. So um, actually one question from Lok Tuang, who asks, have you had a day off since this pandemic began? Have you had any time off to rest, relax, rejuvenate, or has it just been nonstop? Well, I, as every question you've asked me, uh, Ashish, I've given you the true answer. So not to engender any sympathy, but I have not had a single day off since the very beginning of January when we decided that we were going to start working like crazy on a vaccine. And things got really, really intense, as you know, for you and me, as we got into May and June, and they're as intense as they are right now. So the, the unfortunate answer is no, I have not had a day off. Um, what do you do to get a little bit of rest and, and refresh your perspective and your brain? And how do you, how do you keep going? Because it's not just about showing up to work, right? It's really deeply engaging hard work and important work. So what do you do to, to keep yourself sane and, and active in all this? Well, I have an ex a very you know, extraordinary partner, my wife. Um, we also are fortunate in that we're taking care of one of my daughter's dogs, which, <laughs> <laughs> which is a great soothing. Yes. That dog yes. never ever does anything but, but just want to be near me. So what I really do is that every night when I come home, and it's really a routine, you know, as I've told you, uh, Ashish, I spend most of the morning here at NIH with vaccines, therapies. I spend most afternoons at the White House with the task force. When we finish that, I go home, 
I go for a long walk on the c and Canal with my wife and the dog. I come back and then I do emails until the middle of the night. That's one of the banes of our existence. Yeah, emails. Important emails that you have to answer before you go to bed. Yeah. So. Um, I have a lot of other questions, but I'm actually going to go ahead and wrap it up because I know you have an extraordinarily busy afternoon. And uh, I want to say a couple of things. Uh, first of all, on a, on a very personal note, um, thank you for being a role model. And a, um, I think a lot of us in public health look up to you as uh, the person who has always used science and the scientific process as the benchmark by which we guide ourselves. And there is nobody who embodies that better than you do, Tony. So I want to say on a personal level, thank you for that. Um, I know that when I started talking to people about this event, that what I got overwhelmingly from everybody was thank Dr. Fauci for his service to the country. Um, you know how much your service means to people around the country and around the world. Um, not so certainly to us in the Brown community, but across the entire nation and the world. Uh, so thank you for all of that. I do think that we have made extraordinary progress. You know, it feels hard and everybody wants to move on and say, okay, when do we go back? But it is a, an incredible reminder that, that seven, eight months ago, this was not on anybody's radar screen. It was only end of December that we heard about it for the first time. And I think the scientific community has done an extraordinary job and you've really led that for all of us. So on behalf of all of us, thank you for your service to the country. Thank you for your leadership. Uh, and uh, thank you for being a, such an important role model for all of us, Tony. Well, thank you very much, Ashish. Th uh, thank you. I mean that sincerely. None of this could have been done really without the cooperation of people like yourselves and our colleagues in the public health arena and even the young people who we're talking to today because it's going to be their challenge. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure to be with you. And congratulations on your new deanship. And thank I'm you. sure that you and I are going to be reacting, interacting in a really positive way as we go forward. Thank I you. Look, I look forward to it. Be well. Stay safe. Bye-bye.